Hello, everybody. Um, nice to be here, and I will give you the uh, summary of the uh, discussions on the environmental abiotic transformation of nanomaterials. Next slide. We had um, during our session three um, presentations, the first on the transformation pathways, the experiments, the analytics, just the background of the development of the guidance document. Then we had uh, our first results from the lab um, regarding the electron microscopy techniques and regarding also some uh, uh, checks on uh, X-ray uh, techniques um, given by Lucy Stetten. And then Ralph Kigi from Eowak showed us uh, alternative assessments, um, possibilities, wet chemistry, possibilities to monitor sulfidation of calcophyll elements. Um, the important discussion points were um, what are really the dominant pathways of the transformation? So did we really choose those ones that will prevail? Um, the medium composition, of course, and how they this is related to the different transformation pathways the types of nanoparticles to investigate and to use as training materials in the development of the methods and the analytics. And of course, the used techniques and methods that are applied, mainly discussion about the uh, batch approaches, the flow through approaches and the analytics afterwards, TEM, um, X-ray spectroscopy and so on. Next slide. Next slide, yeah, thanks. Um, the uh, transformation pathways that we discussed in terms of chemical transformation of core or shell or surfaces um, is just seen here in the middle of the, of the picture. Um, dissolution and um, aggregation are also other pathways, but they are not considered in the guidance document. And we want to um, look into um, interactions with uh, phosphate, carbonate, sulfate, and probably also chloride, um, because they actually tend to form uh, poorly soluble uh, metal compounds in the aquatic environment and with this actually have the potential to reform new nanomaterials. Uh, we distinguish between two different environments, that's the oxic and the anoxic environment, the anoxic environment in wastewater treatment plants, in uh, microenvironments and flocks, but mainly in sediments of lakes and rivers. Um, in the anoxic part, we uh, consider um, the control of the atmosphere, of course, we're working uh, under uh, anoxic conditions, and we are considering the sulfidation mainly as the major process happening here. Next slide. So um, as controlling factors, of course, the pH is one of the major factors, of course, DOC, natural organic matter is one of the major factors, um, so we have chosen a range of um, acidic to alkaline waters um, with three different um, settings, um, pH from uh, below seven to above seven, of course, uh, five to 8.5. We will use a background electrolyte um, that controls the ionic strength and then actually using trace components that we find in surface waters that can drive actually the reactions towards transformation. Um, we consider the presence and absence of oxygen and the presence and absence of hydrogen sulfide, of course, as well. From these considerations, actually, we come to the composition of the waters, uh, the media. Next slide, please. And uh, we have chosen the um, background electrolyte that we also use in the TG318 for agglomeration, uh, a calcium-magnesium mix with uh, nitrate and uh, sulfate in the background uh, as anions in the system. The pH ranges from 5 over 7 to 8.5, and we use as additional ligands uh, phosphate and NOM. If we go actually to the anoxic environment, uh, we will have additionally um, hydrogen sulfide or sulfide in the system in varying concentrations and, of course, um, phosphate. We also discussed the question of other trace components like iron-2, manganese, dissolved manganese, and others that also can form um, mixed minerals in the end, uh, but uh, have decided that we see this as an exception and not a major pathway. Next slide, please. So we discussed about the range of conditions and there was a suggestion to cover a broader vari variety as we have actually suggested to, for uh, example, also cover wastewater and waste treatment conditions. Uh, we have to balance this against the effort. Um, so the more conditions we are choosing, the more experiments have to be done. Um, that needs to be balanced. 
Um, we discussed the pH range that is different from the OECD 318. Um, we have a more narrow pH range that represents better the environmental ranges. The OECD 318 uses worst case pH conditions for only agglomeration. Um, and we are looking into transformation reactions and we really want to prevent that actually using very low or very high pHs in the test would actually lead to dissolution of the materials. And then actually we would report just dissolution and we would not observe any kind of transformation that would probably take place when we would not actually drive uh, the dissolution that much. Um, then there was a question uh, if how many conditions could be tested and it was said that actually the um, amount of conditions and the number of experiments should actually reflect also the information that we can get out of these, those. And we decided to think about uh, kind of a pre-testing uh, at probably three extreme points. Um, so that actually could give guidance for the further testing routines and also for the further uh, to be tested pathways and could reduce the amount of testing. Uh, we also discussed then uh, what numbers could go out of that, could come out of that. And of course, with the techniques we are using, we will probably not reach quantitative transformation rates. But those actually would be required for um, um, exposure modeling, uh, transport modeling, and uh, we still have to think about um, how we can tackle with those requests uh, towards this guidance document. Um, there's a large amount of potential transformation processes that cannot be all covered in the guidance document, and therefore we decided to provide a review paper uh, based also on the considerations we have already shown in the guidance uh, in the uh, deliverable in Graph for Nano. Um, for this project. And um, so we will provide a com comprehensive uh, review about that as a background uh, for the scientific background, but the guidance document shall actually focus on the most likely or more, most important pathways, because from this at one point, we want to develop uh, a guideline that actually then also has clear experimental approaches. Next slide. Um, regarding the type of nanomaterials, um, yes, it was said but that we are mainly focusing on metal and metal oxides, that's true. Um, and that um, organic pigments, for example, carbon-based nanoparticles and uh, carbonaceous materials are currently not considered because actually in the beginning, we considered the transformation on these materials as being quite hydrophobic in the environment uh, as minor, but the discussion actually that came up made clear that we actually have to consider those materials as well. And we will have a meeting uh, with people experienced in these kind of uh, pigments and so on to discuss how we could actually address that. Next slide. For the uh, techniques that we want to apply, the core method will be that we are attaching the particles to a TEM grid. We go with, a, uh, with the uh, unexposed grid into the TEM, we locate certain regions where the particles sit on the, on the grid. We then expose the grid to certain conditions um, and then we uh, re-examine the particles at the same places um, on the grid again and we'll monitor with this actually together with uh, EDX analysis and analysis for morphology, shape and size, um, the change and transformation of the particles. This is, will be our core method. Next slide. Um, so there was a discussion on this core method because um, the availability of analytical methods is uh, not uh, uniform over all uh, different labs. So the guidance document should also give advice to use uh, alternative techniques, for example, EELS instead of uh, X-ray spectroscopy, um, using SEM uh, instead of TEM and so on. And we will actually provide guidance about the limitations and uh, possibilities of these different analytical approaches. But microscopy will still be considered the best compromise and core method in here. Um, then actually we uh, have to give um, within the analytical restrictions because we are doing an observe, observation and imaging in the TEM together with non-quantitative X-ray analysis. Um, in those cases, actually we will not be able to uh, determine quantitative numbers. If you want to get into really quantitative transformation rates, probably synchrotron techniques would be need needed then. Um, but this can't be a, a requirement for a guideline or a guidance document. This is only just giving guidance. If you want to achieve uh, quantitative data, then we have to go to more sophisticated analytical methods uh, as, as they are available. Um, 
for the way forward, actually, we uh, will now include all those discussions into our developments. We will carry on with the lab, uh, with the laboratory experiments um, with all the particles that we have suggested. We will see how we can harmonize and unify uh, our approaches with the dissolution guidelines that are on the way in the development um, and hopefully have a next um, workshop, the next meeting with our experts in the middle of the next year. I would also like to announce that we want to invite the experts again for the dissolution guideline development early next year. This is just a heads up. You will receive uh, information about this later. Uh, thank you very much. Also, thanks to the experts that actually contributed a lot of knowledge and uh, we had a lively discussion. And um, that's it from my side.